This is a short presentation just to introduce the idea of clinical audit. We're going to ask what is clinical audit, look at a couple of examples, one in radiography, one to do with anaesthetic mortality, and we'll summarise what we've been talking about at the end. So what is clinical audit? Clinical audit is a simple, rational process. It's a sort of common sense thing, but it's one of those things that helps to consider what the process is. Firstly, you want to identify the thing you want to look at. Often something that is either a real problem or potential problem, or something where you can imagine that there might be need for change. We want to define an appropriate standard to which we aspire, to which we wish to achieve. We audit what we currently do in our clinical practice and then compare what we do to that standard and, if necessary, develop a strategy for change. And one of the important aspects of clinical audit is it's a sort of continuous process. So when we've been through this audit cycle once, we want to continue to repeat the audit to check that our standards are staying high or that our strategy for change has actually worked. So when I was in practice, I was renowned for being a particularly bad radiographer. I, for whatever reason, and I'm sure it's nothing to do with the quality of the teaching I received, it, uh, I just would guess at settings for the machine or I would not be careful enough in positioning the animals that I was uh, radiographing. So what proportion of radiographs should be diagnostic? So by diagnostic I mean a, a radiograph that's interpretable, that the positioning is adequate and that the current and voltage settings uh, ensure that we've got the proper exposure. If we're going to do this, we should set a realistic target. It's unreasonable to expect 100% of radiographs to be diagnostic, but we would say expect A, people with doing the radiography in the practice should be roughly equal, and that maybe 85-90% of radiographs are diagnostic. How could we do this? Well, if we just simply record the radiographs taken, record the species, the setting, the radiographer, and then the result, and by the result I mean either is it diagnostic or is it not diagnostic. If we were to do this, we would identify my incompetence and we could then institute a training programme to make sure that he is as good as the rest of the practice or at least on an upward trajectory. And, as I said before, we keep monitoring. So it's likely over time that people will improve. Sometimes they will get worse. We wouldn't expect new graduates necessarily to be as good as experienced family surgeons. Second example is anaesthetic mortality. So imagine a clinical scenario where we've got an equine practice looking at anaesthetic deaths. We want to know what our anaesthetic death rate is and we want to consider what the sort of uh, a, a reasonable level to be expected throughout sort of equine practice. So we're going to search for some data and in order to do this we'll ask ourselves the, the clinical question using the acronym PICO and the patients are going to be a broad mix of performance and recreational horses, mainly adults. Uh, variety of surgical interventions. We may choose to just do elective surgery or do elective surgery and emergency surgery. Intervention uh, is basically conventional induction and maintenance of anaesthesia. The comparison is anaesthetic practices that reflect those that we use and the outcome is going to be post-operative or possibly perioperative mortality. When we look for the evidence, and I would do a PubMed search probably on equine, anaesthetic and death, we come up with this paper which is uh, from Mark Johnson in 1995. This paper gives us an absolute risk figure and it's based on 102 deaths out of 6,255 general anaesthetics. And this gave us a rate of 1.6% excluding euthanasia. 
if we're going to use this figure, we want to know how certain we are that that is the right figure, what is the range in which we can be confident. And a 95% confidence interval gives us a 95% probability uh, range for that figure. That's uh, probably best thought of as if I were to repeat this study 100 times, there'd be a 95% confidence of any one result falling would fall in that line. So I sometimes say if you were to repeat it 100 times, 95% of the results are likely to fall in that region. We can calculate this using a calculator on the back of the envelope, but you'll be pleased to hear that if you were to do a internet search on confidence interval calculator, you can find a website or web page that will do this calculation for you if you enter the figures. And it gives us a figure of plus or minus 0.31% on our 1.6%. So the true figure from that survey is going to fall in the range 1.3%, say, to 1.9%. So we then ask what our rate is. And if we had anaesthetized 272 horses last year and had four anaesthetic deaths, our rate would be 1.5%. It is worth calculating confidence interval on your own rate as well as the um, rate in the paper, uh, although I haven't done so here. Basically, we'd be fairly happy with this rate as it's not greater than the rate published in the paper. But bear in mind, literally just one anaesthetic death more, one anaesthetic death less would make quite a large difference to our rate. And so it is important to interpret one's own data uh, in a proper context or consider what our confidence intervals would be. So what next? What about colic surgery? So maybe we looked at all surgery. We actually did those four deaths were actually all from uh, high risk patients and colics. Um, it's an important aspect that needs consideration. Uh, what we may be like to do if we knew our colic surgery or emergency surgery as opposed to our elective surgery figures to advise our clients about these separately. Can we improve? So even if we're doing well, it gives us an opportunity to measure our performance and identify um, what our previous levels were when we try and do a better job. If we have an anaesthetic death, should we have some sort of protocol for a minimum investigation uh, of it? Um, as a way of identifying potential risk areas or areas where we can improve. Also we're thinking about the audit process itself. Do we have any problems with the audit? Might be an issue with, well, what do we define by an anaesthetic death? Are we talking only about deaths that are actually on the table during anaesthesia or do some anaesthetic deaths occur in the period shortly after the anaesthetic was performed? And we should consider when we're going to do it again. This timing needs to be appropriate so that the benefit is not outweighed by the cost in terms of effort or work to do it again. So something like anaesthetic death is probably something we would want to look at on an annual basis um, rather say, than a weekly or a monthly basis. And should we change the process by which we do the clinical audit? Are there better ways of measuring the thing that we're interested in? So in summary, clinical audit is a systematic appraisal of any outcome or process. It doesn't have to be onerous and shouldn't involve excessive work. And in fact, it will be a disadvantage if it does because the job won't be done as efficiently or as effectively. Um, we won't do as good a job. We want to be able to audit as many of the important tasks that we perform and if any one of them takes most of our effort, then the others will be neglected. To have real value, it does need to be repeated. We're not really comparing ourselves to every other practice. We want to compare our performance to what we are, what our best potential performance would be. And we can only detect change if we repeat the process. And it enables us to appraise our performance. So we know how good we are as vets and in doing that it helps us to identify the ways in which we can improve so what are the areas that we can do the most good in